If you have an internet facing server, chances are that sooner or later, someone is going to try and access it in a way they're not supposed to. On one hand, we want people to access our server, right? We wouldn't put a website there if we didn't want anyone to access it. On the other hand, we don't want the bad guys to access it in some nasty way. One that will give them access to data they're not supposed to have, or the ability to harm our system. That's why it's important to have a well-configured firewall, as it will block any requests that are not permitted according to our set of rules. In this video, I'll be focusing on UFW, or Uncomplicated Firewall, as this is the firewall that Ubuntu is shipped with, and when configured correctly, it can really help. First, let's SSH our server. And let's make sure that we have UFW installed. As I said, Ubuntu comes with it pre-installed, so chances are that you already have it installed on your system, but just to be on the safe side, and in case you're using something different than Ubuntu, let's install it. Let's check the status of our firewall right now. And we can see that it's currently inactive. In a minute, we will activate it, but since we are using SSH to access the server, we need some caution when doing it. From the firewall's perspective, initiating an SSH connection is just another type of request. So if the firewall will just drop SSH requests, we won't be able to use SSH to access the server. And if no alternative way to communicate with it exists, well, we can get locked out. So the order in which we'll work is as follows. First, we will set the firewall's default behavior, which will dictate what it will do with traffic we didn't set a specific rule for. Then, we'll make exception for SSH, to make sure we will be able to communicate with the server even when the firewall is up. And only then, we will activate the firewall. So, let's start with the firewall's default behavior. Every packet has a direction. It may either be sent from the server, which is the case for outgoing traffic, or it may be sent to the server, which is the case for incoming traffic. Generally speaking, we want to block all incoming traffic and to allow all outgoing traffic. The reason for allowing outgoing traffic is that we don't want to restrict requests from the server. We may need to update the server, it may need to connect to some remote database, and in any case, we know that some application within the server is responsible for these packets. So we probably want to allow them. There are some advanced security techniques that use outgoing traffic filtering, but personally, I hardly know anything about it, and it's not that useful anyway, so we're going to allow outgoing traffic. To do that, we're going to use the UFW default allow command. As for incoming traffic, generally speaking, we don't want to allow any of that. There are exceptions, of course, such as SSH connections, but we'll get to that in a minute. The rationale here is that the fewer open ports we have, the fewer holes we have in our defensive walls. Every way to access our system is another potential security weakness, and the less of them we have, the harder it's going to be for an attacker. For that, we're going to use the UFW default deny command. If we just fire up UFW now, we will deny SSH access from ourselves. To be more accurate, the ongoing connection won't break, but it will prevent any new SSH connections. And we want to keep our ability to connect to the server with SSH, so SSH is going to be an exception to our incoming connection denial policy. In other words, we're going to allow incoming SSH connections. And we can see that the rules were updated. It's written twice because the first one refers to IPv4, whereas the second one refers to IPv6. One caveat of working with UFW is that it won't list our rules as long as it's not active. So if we look at its status, it only tells us that it's inactive, but won't list the rules. It will show them, however, once UFW will be active. So let's go ahead and activate it, which can be done with a UFW enable command. And we're being warned that the firewall may disrupt SSH connections. And that's why it's important that first we add the SSH rule and only then enable it. But since we did, we can safely proceed. Great, UFW is enabled. Let's check its status now. And here we can see that when we allowed SSH, all it did is allowed port 22, because that's the port SSH uses. The underlying mechanism of UFW is IP tables, so all of the rules are going to be of this format. We can also use the verbose mode. And now the default behavior is also shown, 
And we can see that by default, we deny incoming traffic and allow outgoing traffic. Let's, for example, install the Apache web server. Apache uses port 80, which we didn't set a rule for, so UFW is going to block it. And indeed, if I try to access the server from a web browser, we don't get any response and the request will eventually time out. So let's add port 80, which is the port for HTTP requests, to our rules. We have two ways to do that. We can allow either HTTP or specifically port 80. Both options will do the same thing. Let's list our rules again. And we can see port 80 on the list. And if we try to access the server now, a request went through and we got the response from the web server. If you host a website that uses a secure connection, you probably want to allow port 443 instead of 80, as this is the port that's used for HTTPS traffic. Let's now see how we can remove a rule. Let's, for example, remove the rules for port 443, as my website uses plain HTTP rather than HTTPS. So first, we need to know the serial number of the rule on the list. To do that, we can use the status command again, but with a numbered flag. So let's start by deleting rule 3. And let's list the rules again. And we can see that the rule for port 443 was removed, but we still have the IPv6 of this rule, so let's also delete this one. And it was deleted as well. As a rule of thumb, when you delete more than one rule, try going from the highest number down. This way, deleting the first rule won't change the numbering of the rest of the rules. So you're going to need to allow the ports according to the applications in your server. For example, if you run a Samba server, you're going to need ports 137, 138, and 139. Every web-based application uses its own ports, and to allow access to it, they must be open. And it's completely okay, as long as you don't allow more than necessary. You might have noticed this from column. The to column is for the destination port, and the from column is for the requester's IP. So currently, port 22 and port 80 will accept requests from any IP address. It doesn't have to be this way. We can, for example, block specific IP addresses. Let's use remote desktop to access my Windows machine. And here is its IP. Let's deny access from the Windows machine. The thing is that the order of the rules matters in UFW. So if the rule to allow access from any IP appears first, adding a new rule to deny specific IPs won't work. So let's first remove the rule to allow access to port 80 from any IP, Now, let's deny access from the Windows machine's IP. And now that this rule was added, we can allow access to port 80 from any other IP. If now we try to access the web server from the Windows machine, it doesn't get any response. But if we try the same thing from a Linux machine, a 
a request goes through. We can also use the same thing to deny entire subnets. So let's remove the rules we currently have for port 80. And let's block port 80 from our entire subnet. Notice that now I specify the number of the port because I only wanted to block this specific port and not the entire subnet altogether. And now we won't be able to access port 80 from anywhere on this subnet. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.